since my name is not normally this large, but since it was a TED talk, uh, they adopted the TED format. So my topic's a little different, but I think it does fuse the peace box and the war box that we heard earlier, because it's very much a dimension of global security. And I would argue, and I hope you'll agree at the end of my talk, this is a domain which is very much uh, an emergent threat, but neglected. So it is infectious disease at one level, and it's relentless dynamics. We are facing old foes resurgent. The most dangerous place now in America is a hospital in terms of antibiotic-resistant infections. If someone had to say to me, what do I consider to be the biggest single infectious disease threat, it is still pandemic flu. We have the much publicized Hollywood apocalyptic dimension of new diseases like Ebola. Things move fast around the world, and we must, of course, add to this bioterrorism, and as I'll end with my talk, new technologies will, in fact, alter this entire dynamic. But we again have a silo problem, and that is the fact we've tended to look at human health separate from animal health, separate from ecosystem health. They're inextricably linked. Most of the diseases that now affect us are called zoonoses. They come from animals. At the same time, strategically, how do we feed 9 billion people going forward? Of the 6 billion people with us today, 2 billion of them don't have access to clean water. Almost a million don't have access to adequate water. We're depleting natural resources. New patterns of agriculture are giving rise to new patterns of disease. Climate change is altering vector spread. And it would be generous to say that the World Health Organization even has a biosurveillance. Let us euphemistically call it fragile at best. But it is this disease burden, apart from its horrific impact on those affected, is in fact a source of global instability. Inadequate infrastructure, so there is Ebola. At the same time, distrust of authorities and individuals who escape from a quarantine facility being bundled back in. The dreaded triad of poverty, illiteracy, combined with infectious disease. The omnipresent issue of famine. 40 million orphans, courtesy of HIV in, in Africa, has fueled the child soldier problem. We could, in fact, for the refugee crisis, actually put the Congo there rather than the much more publicized one in Europe. But either way, the military implications of this are substantial, either by humanitarian intervention or when the military has to be deployed to a hot zone, courtesy of the economic political instabilities that these types of burdens will create. At the same time, in a world of global transport, with almost a billion people moving around the world, we have rapid spread. We had five cases of Ebola passively transferred to the United States, at the same time that 1.5 million cases of chikungunya were spread in the Caribbean basin. The reason most of you didn't know about it is because it's too complex a word for most newscasters to pronounce. <laughs> but we have to basically look at this in terms of the context of a comprehensive global biosurveillance. Zoonoses are the biggest single challenge we face, not just pandemic flu. HIV had its origins in monkeys and primates. West Nile, a complex interplay between animals. MERS in the Middle East. Ebola, probably the primary vector and reservoir source, is bats. A huge bushmeat ch uh, food chain in Africa and, of course, the tragedy that we're seeing now unfolding courtesy of Zika with microcephalic children. Bottom line is what's out there. Because we have almost a million people a day moving into urban zones. 52% of the world now lives in urban zones, and a significant fraction of those live in slums. The worst possible situation, high population density for the transmission of infection, and those urban megapoli, particularly in Asia, Africa, and South America, are pushing out into virgin eco-terrain, where, in fact, we there find these new exotic organisms that we've never seen before, the zoonotic threat, courtesy of urbanization, and, of course, once again, inadequate infrastructure. Military operations must consider operating in collapsing urban environments. The joint uh, uh, urban operations uh, doctrine gives scant attention to this. It is not simply the lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan. It's more a Mogadishu on steroids. How do you protect the force when deployed into a hot zone, as they were in the case of Ebola? But it is a collapse in civil disorder will be the norm in these urban megapoli into which they will be deployed. And if you look at the Quadrennial Defense Review, this issue barely surfaces at all.
If there's one thing where we should be investing, it is biosurveillance, our capability to understand what's out there, and there are three dimensions to that as there is in any intelligence. How do you find out what is out there to profile it? Finding the genetic signatures of these new organisms, having rapid deployable point of care mechanisms to detect it, and then to have real time situational awareness to respond to that threat. We have to sample broadly. One always sends one's best graduate students to sample the nostrils of seals, uh, but uh, the, uh, that, that, that means if their paper only gets a B. The bottom line is the fact that we have this broad spectrum of sentinel species. Real time, the beast on the hip has become a very real mode of tra tra reporting information. Upload that information for real time intelligence, whether it be the distribution of infection in Washington, D.C., the availability of hospitals, movement, and so forth. Critical issue to move from ground zero data to real time intelligence. But if you don't have drugs and vaccines, isn't this a telling picture? There is a physician from the bubonic plague in the 15th century. Note the resemblance when we have no drug and no vaccine in Liberia, a telling similarity. It's a societal choice. Do we want vaccines or Viagra? We've basically got out of the business of making new vaccines simply because we're not prepared to pay for them. If we're going to deal with these issues, we're going to have to re-incentivize industry to re-engage. Industry spent over $110 million engaging on Ebola, and then suddenly it's out of sight, out of mind. That's $110 million they have to bear as a loss on their balance sheets. We have to be far more uh, proactive. Out of sight, out of mind, by definition. Comfort and complacency are always the enemies of vigilance and preparedness, whether it be nations, corporations, or sports teams. 1947, penicillin. It was predictable that in, the, in 2010, we would have a growing antibiotic resistance problem. We now have the first organisms with us which are resistant to every single antibiotic that we have. Slow mobilization. Polio was a national priority. We mobilized all skill. It was a war against polio. Now, so there is a national blueprint for biodefense from Tom Ridge and Joe Lieberman, which I was pleased to serve as a member of that. It's a devastating indictment of the absolute lack of preparedness of this nation, indeed global preparedness against whether the assault be natural organisms or uh, bioterrorism. And since 9-11, we have basically dissipated billions of dollars with no, res with no real response and most importantly, no accountability for that. And then there's the future where I basically live. The question was raised earlier this morning. We're in the era of digital biology, it from bits. Every piece of DNA is merely digital. I can send it around the world and have a virus synthesized on the other side of the world the next day. That's where we are. At the same time, do we use technologies, the same information being used for beneficent purposes and malevolent purposes? That threat is growing, but it's no longer bugs. It's the circuit diagram of every one of the 276 different cell types that exist in your body. That's obviously the future of precision medicine, but it is also the future that if we know the circuit diagram, we can screw it up. And obviously, one of the obvious issues of great concern is that in relation to cognitive and sensory functions in the brain. And if we think we are alone, the biggest genetic center in the world is in China. That's the Beijing Genome Institute with a powerful computational capacity. At least the intelligence community understands this. This is DNI Clapper's recent report. And gene editing now makes the top six threats that he views as the most existential. But what we have to bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that this is a technology diffusion which was emphasized this morning. It's quick, it's rapid. High school students can do some of this now. What a person won a Nobel Prize for 20 years ago, my grandchildren are doing. The Chemical and Biological Weapons Convention is totally outmoded. This is not some saturation stuff dropped from the sky. This is very subtle bioengineering. And this is here, ladies and gentlemen, today. This is not something for tomorrow. So I've given you a very superficial surf across a very broad, multi-dimensional challenge. We have to think about health now on a global scale, not just about us, anthropocentric dimensions, but the interrelationship of human, animal, and ecosystems.
Globalization and urbanization are giving rise to new disease patterns. Those will inevitably result in military intervention, whether humanitarian or overt conflict. We need to have global biosurveillance capabilities. Private sector must be re-incentivized to invest in this area. And the symposium in its own right, perhaps next year in future war, is where will synthetic biology and the expanding dual use threat take us. And we indeed have major gaps in our preparedness both at the level of strategy, policy, and capabilities. So with 11 seconds left, I hope that that is at least a superficial surf across a fascinating subject. Thank you.